Hey everyone, thank you for joining me for my life as a Jehovah's Witness and why I left. Chapter 4. I'm going to pick up where I left off when we returned back from New Orleans. We tried to put our life pieces back together financially and we just couldn't. Harry had gotten in contact with his father, from what I recall, and his father made him an offer he couldn't refuse. His father had a business, a lifelong business, um, in the ceramic shop business. That's the only way I can remember how to call it. He had a store and he had ceramics and all the equipment and sold the ceramics and taught classes and stuff like that. It was a very lucrative business, actually. His father told him that if he came and moved to Birmingham, Alabama, since he was getting older, he would make him 50-50 partner in this business. So we thought, what have we got to lose? Um, we decided to move and we loaded up a U-Haul and trucked all the way from Miami to Birmingham, Alabama. His father had promised that he would set us up in a uh, apartment for the first few months until we got on our feet and um very nice apartment and we moved moved there and what we didn't realize at the time um we, we kind of we got played by his father his father um and i was warned about this from harry's sisters his father is a true con artist. I mean, a true con artist. Um, you would never believe it. You, when you first meet him, this was my first time meeting my father-in-law. Charming, intelligent, just, you know, wins you over and, and you end up thinking, oh, what I've heard about you is just not true. But it ended up being true. So, his father was remarried and for the, I think the third time and this woman had a son and it turns out that this young teenage son of hers was also promised 50-50 partnership in the business of my father-in-law that he promised to his own son. We we just dealt with it as best as we could. We ended up not even, after a little while of realizing the, the scam, the sham, and all of that, um, that was going to go down, and it did go down, we realized that we needed to find our own work. While we're here in this city we've never lived in before, um, I ended up working for kinder care for a little while, um, and Harry... Uh, I don't, yeah, I think he worked at a grocery store in a deli department or something like that because he didn't really have any skills, sadly. So um, we were just trying to make ends meet. And of course, we were down to the one car, my car, because he got rid of his. And uh, during all this time, we were there for about six months. Um, he still continued to study the Bible um, with some Jehovah's Witnesses that we had established ourselves with the congregation there. And he ended up getting baptized at one of the uh, Jehovah's Witness conventions that they have every year. Um, he got baptized in 19, I would say 96 or 97. I can't remember what year it was. No, not 96, 86 or 87. And, um, I've got pictures still of, of him getting baptized. Of course, I had to take pictures to prove to my family that that, that he did get baptized because they never thought he would ever get baptized, but he did. But to make this very long story short, um, we did not stay in Birmingham very long. Everything turned to hell. Um, he ended up um, severing ties, sadly, with his father. Um, it, it was just a really bad situation. Everything that we owned at that point as a newlywed couple, we had brand new furniture. Um, 
we ended up having to have it repossessed or sell because we just couldn't afford anything. My car, my very first car that I bought on my own, uh, ended up being repossessed. Now we went with a tr with a U-Haul truck load full of all of our belongings, and by the time we left Birmingham, um, we flew back home with two very large boxes that just contained our clothes for uh, several months because we had to sell everything that we owned just to pay the rent on the apartment that his, his father promised that he would take care of. He reneged on that. Um, we were sleeping on the floor in the apartment. It, it, was, it was really, really, really tough times desperate times and um we ended up having to tuck our tails between our legs and humble ourselves and come back to miami by the grace of my parents i we didn't know who to ask to, for help so we ended up staying we moved back ended up moving back to my parents home and we were only married not even two years yet when all of this <laughs> happened. That was rough, sleeping on their sofa bed in their living room for a little, for a couple, mm, couple of weeks maybe, until some um, friends in the congregation had told us about um, an apartment condo that was for rent and uh, through another Jehovah's Witness who owned it. And they, it was a great opportunity. It was great, great price for the, for the uh, place where we ended up living the whole time that we were, uh, remained there in Miami until we moved up here. So we had to, you know, find new jobs. He ended up working for Xerox. Um, getting a job, landing a good job with Xerox Corporation back in the day. I found different, um, I found a job working for an insurance company, just whatever we could find, just to start all over again. We ended up having to file Chapter 13 bankruptcy um, because of the debts that we did incur um, that we just couldn't pay back. My ex-husband said, you know, this is the best, they're going to be the best thing for us. Yeah, it's going to hurt us for a long, long time in a financial way, credit wise, but we didn't really have any choice. Um, we bought a used car so that we can get around and <sighs> we're, we were in Miami and uh, he continued with his studies um, with, you know, not studies with, well, he did, what I mean to say is he continued in his pursuit. He became very, very into, interested in learning more about the Bible. He's a very intelligent guy, like I said before, um, and he loved to study and boy, did he study. That's really, he, he just studied a lot, a lot, a lot. His goal was to become an elder one day in the congregation, but before you become an elder, you you like little steps, you have little levels. And um, he ended up becoming a ministerial servant, which is the level just below an elder where you have some responsibilities and things like that. And he would give public um, speeches, talks uh, to the congregation. He was very good at it, um, really, really, good speaker, very natural. Everybody was impressed. This, this person who very new as a Jehovah's Witness just took, took on, took it on like nobody's business. And I was happy because I thought, ha ha, you know, what, what should not have worked is working out in my favor. You know, God, God, God's probably happy with me that I brought, I helped save, save a soul in a sense by bringing Harry into what they call the truth, um, about the faith and all of that. So, um, 
we continued up until uh, living in Miami, um, up until 1994. In 1992, um, 91 and 92, I became a regular pioneer. And what that is in the Jehovah's Witness organization, I may have touched on it before, is you d devote one whole year of your life or more to primarily preaching. They require you to accumulate 1,000 hours from September 1st all the way through the following October, uh, August 31st. You have to um, have acquired 1,000 hours of field service time, ministry, mi ministry time. And if you do continue, if you do make those 1,000 hours, you're allowed to continue again and again and again for as long as you want, for as long as you can afford to. Um, and so I did that. And in 1992, um, Hurricane Andrew hit. And um, it was it was horrible. Um, it was just such a such a big nightmare for for everyone there in that area and it really affected um no matter who you were what religion you were part of it it hit it hit really really hard and uh at that time right around that time um harry and i had started our own business we both left our jobs again to start our own business. He was taught by a friend of his how to lay tile, floor tile, bathroom tile, you name it. And he was very talented, talented. And I helped him and I have to pat myself on the back too because it was just the two of us doing this really um, rewarding but very hard work and paid really well, paid so, so good. To lay floor tile or any kind of tile in Miami, that's what people have in their homes. You don't really have carpet like, like how we have up here in Georgia and in the North, you have tile. And especially after Hurricane Andrew hit, if you did have carpet with all the flooding that happened, you ripped that carpet out and you put tile because tile doesn't, doesn't um, change with any kind of flooding. It stays tile, stays nice. So we did that for years and years, even after until he moved up here. He had um, really acquired a name for himself and it was just word of mouth, one job after another job after another job. It just, it paid really well, but still we didn't have anything. Everything that we had at that time and until we divorced, were hand-me-downs from people. We didn't have anything nice, no nice cars, nothing. He just, I don't know what he spent his money on or our money on, but he just was horrible with money. It would just burn a hole in his pocket. And we were always, always, always struggling financially. And it was always a big problem for our marriage. A lot of our arguments were about money and the lack of it. Um, when we moved up here to Georgia in 1994, March of 1994, um, we decided to move up here because we came to visit a friend and to the Gainesville area that was that had moved and fell in love with the area. We always wanted to start a family and we didn't really want to start a family in Miami because it's just not a good environment for children. And we wanted to build our own home, but we knew we couldn't afford land or anything like that um, down in Miami. So we had taken a look around when we were here visiting and saw that everything was much, much more affordable up here to do to follow our dreams of building our own home and having a family. So we ended up um, doing that. We 
moved up here in March of 94. My family, minus my sister, who was still down there in Florida, um, all moved up here. My mom and dad did not want to be apart from me, so they moved too, which they had always wanted to move up here. They always loved the mountains and this area, so it was it was a win-win for them. And I'd, I'm glad that they did. I'm very, very glad that they did. So we moved up here, and uh, we started our, our new life here in Georgia. I started working in the medical field, and I loved it and haven't looked back since. Worked for different doctors before I actually started working for LabCorp as a phlebotomist, what I went to school for. And Harry continued with the tile work business and I would also still help him on the weekends if he needed my help. And we ended up finding some property, found about, I think it was an acre and a half over on Poplar Springs Road in Gainesville. Beautiful. It was a, it's a very nice subdivision um, down that road and found a beautiful property. Um, Harry had learned how to draw up his own blueprints. He studied plumbing. He studied electrical. He studied everything he possibly could because when I say we built our own home, we, we built our own home. The majority him, he did everything. I'm telling you, this man is extremely intelligent, can learn to do anything. I wouldn't put nothing past him. So we ended up taking a, um, a type of loan through a bank that works like this, where you, it's a, it's, it's to, um, loan you the money in steps to help make build your own home yourself um i forgot what it's there's a special name for it and i'm excuse me i'm drawing a blank but anyway we got this loan from this bank and when you do the work like get different steps you know like let's say we of course we had to lay the foundation um concrete slab foundation so out of our own pocket and i'm the only one working um, at the time, because technically he was still doing tile work, but once he actually started building the house, he did less work so that he could build this house as quickly as possible because the bank also gives you such a certain amount of time to finish and complete this house so they can go ahead and put the mortgage and blah, blah, blah. So... Once you once once you do a certain task like the foundation, do the concrete foundation, and they the bank comes out and looks, make sure you did the foundation, it passes inspections and blah blah blah. Whatever that costed you, the bank now puts that money in your account and you use that money to pay for the next step and so forth and so forth. It's just that's how it that's how it rolls. So we got to almost completion of this house and once again he did everything now we he didn't pour the concrete himself he had to hire a company but he was out there with them you know smoothing it out and all that he put up all the 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 walls the roof the drywall the this the that whatever he he um did a retaining wall and the driveway and he did everything, everything. Um, and during this time, of course, we're still um, wanting a family and we had been trying and trying, we've been trying to have a baby, trying to make a baby. And for years, nothing was happening. So, you know, you just kind of like think, well, one day it'll happen. Well, one day it finally did happen. Um, it was in the early spring of, let me see, I put it in my notes, of 1997. So here we're married already 12 years. That's all it, yeah. Cause we really were not protecting ourselves as far as not trying to have a baby. I wasn't on any birth control or anything. So it took 12 years um, to try actually conceive a child. And it finally happened 
it was so cool. I, <laughs> I was working for um, the Northeast Georgia Medical Center, an NGPG group uh, with two doctors and had a great group of girl, girl co-worker friends that have been following me on this story, by the way. So, hey, hey to, to, to my friends. I don't want to say your name, so. But um, I don't know if they'll remember this, but um, one of the nurses there did a pregnancy test on me, and I was floored. I, it came up positive. I was pregnant. And I was so excited, so, so, so excited. And then they did the blood test and um, to confirm. And of course it confirmed. And I wanted to surprise Harry in, you know, the cutest way that I could think of, spur of the moment. So I went to Walmart or something like that. And I found these cute little bibs for babies and it and it, just a couple of them, and it says something about, you know, the greatest, world's greatest dad, or I love my daddy, or something like that. And that's, I put him in a, wrapped him up and everything. And I, uh, when he came home one, e uh, that evening or the next evening, I think it was that evening, um, I surprised him with that. And we were just ex so excited. We told, of course, the family, my parents, everybody was so happy. It was just really, really, really neat. R just, it was, it was something we both had wanted so bad, especially me. I always, always, always wanted to be a mom. I just, I just knew I was going to be a good mom. I was going to be the best mom that I could be. And I, I couldn't wait to have that experience. And I wanted a boy. I don't know why I didn't want a girl. Of course, it didn't matter. But I always wanted to have my first child to be a son. Because growing up, I always wished that I had a big brother. I think big brothers are cool. And I never had a big brother. I had some big brother-like friends. And they meant a lot to me. And so I just wanted my children, my my second and what, however many after that, to have a big brother. We had picked out names. Um... If it was a boy, um, the child's name was going to be Alexander James. We were going to call him Alex. And um, if it was a girl, it was going to be Amanda Brooke. And uh, we were excited. We were really excited. So about nine weeks later, um, and if I get if I get a little emotional, forgive me. Um, Nine weeks later, it was a work day, and I um, got up for work, and I was having, no, excuse me, nine weeks later, it was a, there was, it was a weekend, and I had started to spot. I started to have some bleeding. On a, It was a Friday, and I called the doctor, my obstetrician's office, and they said, don't worry about it. That's very normal. Just lay low over the weekend. If it gets any worse, then you need to go to the emergency room, you know, but give it a couple of days. Only if it gets worse, do you need to go to the emergency room to, you know, to see what's going on. So this was Friday. Saturday rolls around, still spotting. Sunday rolls around. It was getting worse. The bleeding was increasing. And so Harry took me to the emergency room and I saw um, with the practice that in Gainesville, Long Street, up, um, OB, um, I saw um, the male, the male Dr. Dillard. Everybody in town here knows who Dr. Dillard is and his wife. They're both, um, I don't know if they're both obstetricians, gynecologists still. They might just be gynecologists, but... Back then in 97, um, Dr. Dillard saw me in the ER. He was on call. He was not my obstetrician. He was just on call. And he said, well, let's do an ultrasound and see what's going on. Didn't do any blood work, zero blood work, and just did an ultrasound. 
the ultrasound tech is doing her little ultrasound. My ex is there next to me. And she says out loud, and this is something no ultrasound tech is supposed to even, they're not even supposed to say anything about what they're saying or really talk to you or question you. I'll never forget it. She said, you're not pregnant, are you? And I looked at her. I said, uh, yeah, I am. And she didn't say anything else. So she finishes the ultrasound. I wait for the doctor to read the report. And he says, it looks like you're miscarrying, um, that you're losing the baby. And um, I'm like, okay, you know, he says, that's why you're bleeding. You know, this is what to expect that will happen over the next few days, blah, blah, blah. And again, no blood work. Now, I'm, I work, I, I, I'm not dumb. I know a lot about the medical field. I'm not a doctor, but I do know a lot about laboratory testing, especially when it comes to this kind of scenario. When you have someone who you're thinking is having a miscarriage, you do some, you do blood work and then you check blood work in the next few days because you're supposed to see those um, pregnancy hormone levels slowly come down, the numbers slowly to drop to indicate that the uh, pregnancy is terminating itself. None of that was done. None of that. And it didn't click because I was in shock. I was in a sense of grief already. I'm like, oh man, I'm only nine weeks in and I'm losing my baby. And um, so that happened, went home. Um, life was normal for about another week. And I, it was a work, now back to the work day. I woke up, tried to get ready for work. And I was doubled over in pain. I mean, doubled over. I, I, I to, 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 to stand up was just excruciating pain. The worst pain I have ever experienced to this day. I felt like somebody was taking a rusty dagger and just stabbing me on my right side, on the right side of my body, from from right where my my rib cage ends, all the way down to my to my groin, to my hip, that whole side. And I called my mom. Harry was already at the property working on the house, as he was devoted to working on the house. I couldn't get a hold of him because it was before cell phones. We didn't have cell phones back then in 1997. So I couldn't get a hold of him. So I had gotten a hold of my mom at home. I said, I think you need to come and, and pick me up because I, I couldn't even drive. I couldn't even walk. Hardly, the pain was excruciating. I didn't know what was wrong with me because I, I thought, well, what's going on? You know, I'm, I've already miscarried. This can't be what miscarrying feels like. It's, not, it's just supposed to be like a heavy period. So this just was not normal. So I had my mom take me to the doctors where I worked to have one of the doctors check me out. And he was baffled. He thought maybe it was my gallbladder since it was on the right side. He, he was baffled and, and he really didn't have any answers for me. So he said, you're in so much pain. You just need to go to the emergency room. So my mom takes me to the emergency room and they do all kinds of, they do pelvic exams. They do all kinds of x-rays and this, that, and whatever. Nobody knows what's wrong with me. What's causing me to be in so much pain? Nobody. So they say, we're going to admit you overnight for observation until we can figure this out. So they admit me overnight. Um, my mom and dad, you know, they, they left, my mom left me there. I said, I'll be fine. I'm sure I, they did get a hold of Harry at the property. Um, my dad had went over there to let him know what was going on. Um, do you think that he showed up to stay with me in the hospital? No, no. 
He didn't. Um, it, that, that was just like, wait a minute, you know, uh, <laughs> this is your wife. You just lost a baby. Now she's in the hospital. They don't know what's wrong with her. But no, the house, the building of the house was more important than me. So I stay overnight in the hospital. My mom arrives first thing in the morning and I still haven't heard anything about what's going on and what's wrong with me um, until the doctor comes in and says, we realize that you are bleeding internally, but we don't know why. We, so we're going to do laparoscopic surgery to take a look on the inside to see what's going on. But because you're bleeding internally, you're going to need a blood transfusion. Now, this is the thing that my mom had cried about when she was first becoming a, uh, learning about Jehovah's Witnesses. Her daughter now is in a life-threatening situation where she has to have a blood transfusion in order to live. Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that it is scripturally correct or morally correct to get a blood transfusion. They use um, two scriptures, Acts, uh, uh, in the book of Acts chapter 17, I wanna say, in verse 29 talks about um, the pouring out of blood, that if blood is to be leaving your body, it's supposed to be poured out upon the ground because it's sacred and holy. And then also in the book of Leviticus, supposedly it says sim similar, a similar law or whatever. They also, Jehovah's Witnesses um, organization provide each and every baptized witness a uh, no blood card. That's what we called it. It was a little card, little paper card, like a credit in the shape of a credit card that we kept in our wallets at all times that says that at for no uncertain reasons are we to be given blood by any means. No, we sign it. It's considered a legal document the way that they worded everything on this on this card. And so I, I, because I was very strong in my faith as a Jehovah's Witness, I felt like, okay, you know, if this is my time to go because I can't take a blood transfusion, then it's, then this is how it has to be. I will, I will not take a blood transfusion. So after the doctor tells us this, he says, I'm going to send the anesthesiologist in, the, uh, in next so that he can get you ready for surgery and explain to you about, um, you know, the blood, trans the blood transfusion that you're going to undoubtedly need. So he comes in and I flat out say, nope, I'm sorry, I will not take a blood transfusion. And without me even explaining or, or getting ready to say what I really wanted to say, um, he became irate. Uh, he went, he went, raced out of the room, screaming down the hall, she won't take a blood transfusion. She said she won't take a blood transfusion. My mom tries to run after him, calls him back. And we both explained to him, there's other things that you can do for me Besides a blood transfusion, there is a machine that's called a cell saver that Jehovah's Witnesses uh, say is, is, is um, morally acceptable to your conscience. If you choose to have this machine reroute any lost blood into this machine, filter it, clean it, and put it right back into your body. If, it's, if your conscience allows it, then you can have a use this machine. I felt, yes, I want to use this machine. So he felt relieved somewhat with that. Um, they did rush me into surgery. They did use the cell saver machine. I believe I would be dead if not for that machine, without a doubt. Um, I'm in recovery. And what they found out when they did the laparoscopic surgery was that I had never miscarried. 
I had never miscarried. I had an ectopic pregnancy and that was the cause for my bleeding internally. My baby decided to grow inside my fallopian tube which is the width of one strand of your hair. And I was already nine weeks. So this baby just grew and grew and grew inside my fallopian tube instead of my uterus. So much so that the, the fallopian tube ruptured on my right side. My right fallopian tube ruptured, which that rupture killed my baby. And that's what they found out. That's when they found out why I was bleeding internally. Um, that I had an, a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Most women back in the day, and even today, sadly, because it's very much misdiagnosed. If they had done blood work, they would have seen, but they, they would have done blood work. They would have seen that I was not miscarrying. They could have prevented it. That's their, if they didn't see the baby in the uterus on the ultrasound, that means that baby is somewhere else based on the blood work. And they didn't do it. I should have sued them. I could have sued them. But Harry said, no. No, you're not going to sue them. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, should have sued them. So that something like this could be prevented to any other woman out there. So I had lost, the doctor came in after, the, after I was recovering and I had lost, now there's only one gallon of blood in, in an adult human body. Just only one gallon, that's all we have. That's why when you donate blood, you can not donate more than one pint because donating more than one pint would make you feel really bad and you would probably need to have some of it put back in your body because it's your body can't reproduce it quick enough if you lose more than a pint. I lost two and a half liters of blood, according to the doctor. Two and a half liters I lost. And that's using the cell saver machine that I only lost that amount. Like I said, I should be dead if it weren't for that self saver machine. I should be dead. Um, the doctor said I came this close to dying, and he was—he's right. He's right. When he, when I look back, when I looked back at it, and I still look back at it, only by the grace of my Creator am I still here. For. And I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful that I'm still here because I really feel like my life, my life's purpose has been opened up to me and I know why I am still here. And I am, um, I'm very grateful. <laughs> it was, it was horrible going through that. Only after my surgery did my husband decide to show up. My mom and dad are there in the room with me. They had me um, hooked up on morphine because of the pain. And um, they had told me, that, like, you know, I don't know if anybody's been in the hospital and been put on a morphine drip, but they um, give you a little button. And when you feel like you can, you need more medicine for the pain, you push the button. But morphine also has like, People have different reactions on the morphine. Apparently, I was very funny and dopey and just like, woo, you know. And um, Harry thought it was funny to keep pushing the button. He kept pushing and pushing and pushing, purposely getting me high and doped out on this morphine. He thought it was funny. Doing this in front of my parents, mocking me and how I was acting on the morphine in front of my parents. They tell me this later. I was mortified. 
And and when I found out that that had happened, I I, I did I wasn't in pain anymore. I said, get this away from me. I didn't even want the morphine anymore. I didn't even want the morphine. So later that day, they got rid of it. They got rid of it. And he, of course, left. He did not stay with me. I was in the hospital for two, two nights. And he didn't even stay with me, not one night. He was just there for me for a little while after surgery and then went back to the property to continue building our home. I don't know how you feel about that. The home could have waited. I needed him. I needed my husband to be there with me while I am re-grieving the loss of our child. He never grieved not until a few years later, which I'll get into. But he, uh, he never grieved. Um, it just was the most horrific experience I've ever been through in my whole life. Because of my blood loss, when I got home, um, he wasn't even there with me to take care of me at all during my recovery, and it was a couple of weeks of recovery because of my blood loss. Um, of course, I was on iron and stuff, but it takes a long time to build your blood, black, blood back after that grade of a loss. And just to take a few steps, like from the bed to the bathroom, it was exhausting. I've never experienced such fatigue like that in my whole life. Fortunately, I had good friends um, that I had made in the congregation. I thought they were my good friends. I'll tell you, that's another story um, for later. But the friends that I had at the time, they were great. They they came and helped take care of me and and picked me up and took me to the doctor, you know, for my checkups after the surgery and everything. I, I'm so grateful to all of them that helped me where it was should have been something that my my husband should have been doing. Not my friends. My husband should have been doing that. But the husband I have now, hmm. He made up for it. He made up for that idiot's um, lack tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold. Um, I couldn't have asked for a better husband. Um, yeah, made up for it. Um, let me see what else I wanted to say. So with that loss, um, things in our marriage did not get really much, much better. And this has taken a lot longer than I thought. I don't want the, these videos to be taking too, too long. Um, so, cause I know everybody's time is valuable. I don't want you to sit here for an hour listening to my story. Although the story is becoming lengthy because there are so many details that are important. And I felt that, that this particular, uh, what I just mentioned about the blood transfusions, Jehovah's Witnesses, all of that was an important thing for y'all to know that what their doctrine is on that. It is just, I don't believe in that anymore, obviously. Um, again, they have twisted the scriptures to make them seem like this is, this is what our creator expects of us. But again, no, no, it's murder. It's like, it's like, it, it, it's, it's just a loving God would not want any of us to suffer in that way, um, to sacrifice our lives unnecessarily because we can't accept blood from someone else that could save our life. No, that's, that's just not what I believe anymore. So I'm going to pick up about the real, real ending of my marriage um, in chapter five um, soon. Hopefully this weekend. Yeah, definitely this weekend. I'm sure I can get to chapter five to finish this out, this, finish out this segment uh, the, of the story, this part of the story. So stay tuned for that. The final, final part of my marriage and how it ended and then... We'll talk about some other um, subjects. 
some other crazy doctrines and things that they Jehovah's Witnesses believe in. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for letting me get that off my chest once again. It feels, it does feel good. I've told the story many times, but I've never told it like this. And I hope that I can reach as many people as possible um, in regards to this story. I hope it can help others. I don't want anybody to go through what I have been through, especially with the blood transfusion issue. Totally unnecessary. Totally unnecessary. So thank you so much again for your time. And um, the comments are available now. If you want to leave a comment or question, if you have a question, um, please feel free to ask any ask anything you want. I am an open book. And I hope you all have a great rest of your time after you've watched this video with your loved ones and family. And I'll see you soon. Bye.